Okay, yeah. So, uh, shall we carry on? You ready? Yeah? Okay. Okay, good. <laughs> so, uh, we are looking at the uh, suttas uh, uh, on the five sense world. Uh, yeah, what the five sense world is like from the Buddha's point of view. And these similes. Uh, and uh, the idea, just to be clear about what the idea behind these things is, the idea is just to how to contemplate that world, how to think about it. Yeah, it's not so much kind of, you know, this means that we have to reject that world or anything like that. It's more like just, uh, this is a way of thinking about it. Uh, and then the mind kind of leans in a kind of a new direction. It sees things in a new way, and that's always very useful to be able to support the meditation practice and all of these kind of things. That's the idea. That's the idea, the reality, not true, but that's the idea. So, um, uh, let's go on to the next simile. And this is the famous simile of the borrowed goods. So the one I teach most of the time, because it is maybe the most easy one to relate to. So this is a relatable uh, simile as far as the five sense world is concerned. And it goes as follows. Suppose a man had borrowed some goods, a gentleman's carriage and fine jeweled earrings, and proceeded and surrounded by these, he, pro he proceeded through the middle of Apana. Apana is a town. When people saw him, they would say, this must be a wealthy man, for that is how the wealthy enjoy their wealth. But when the owners saw him, they would take back what was theirs. What do you think? Would that be enough for that man to get upset? Yes, sir. Why is that? Because owners took back what was theirs. This is the simile for the five sense world. Yeah, and it is kind of a little bit quaint simile because a man has borrowed some goods. What has he borrowed? He has borrowed a carriage. A carriage, like probably horse-drawn carriage and some jeweled earrings. So that's what you borrow when you look rich in ancient India. You borrow, borrow a carriage and you borrow jeweled earrings. Then you are wealthy if you have those things. So this is kind of a different time, a different age. And then the slightly strange translation, I have to admit, I'm not too impressed with my friend Bhante Sujato about this. Preceded and surrounded by these. What is that supposed to mean? Preceded and surrounded by these. So this is a really weird translation. Basically, it means he is enjoying them. That's really what it means. Yeah, he has these things, uh, and he's probably sitting in that carriage, and he is wearing the earrings. Uh, yeah, and then he, uh, or, or maybe they are, yeah, so su surrounded. I don't know how you can be surrounded by je jeweled earrings, but anyway, that's, that's what it seems to be saying. The translation is not entirely without problem. But anyway, I shall uh, uh, refrain from criticizing my good friend too much. <laughs> uh, he goes to the middle of the town. Yeah, Apana is one of the towns in ancient India. So he goes through the city and then people see him. Yeah, look and they say, check it out. Uh, this must be a wealthy man. That is how the wealthy enjoy their wealth. They go around wearing jeweled earrings and they travel around in carriages. Uh, yeah, and you know what it is like. And I'm sure many people who are wealthy, this is kind of how you think about things, yeah? You uh, travel around in your Rolls Royce and you live in a big mansion and it has kind of barbed wire around it, no one can get access to it. Uh, and uh, sometimes people, they kind of, after a while you start to identify with your wealth. Uh, it's like you become that wealthy person psychologically. Psychologically, this is how you see yourself. Uh, and uh, once you identify with something, uh, it becomes very important to you. Huh? Yeah, and that's why people sometimes they're very wealthy and they lose their wealth, they despair because it's not so much that you lose your ability to buy things, that is one thing, yeah, but you lose your status, huh? you lose your sense of self. Huh? And this is kind of really hard, I think, for some people. Huh? Now, before you're wealthy, now you are poor, and that's kind of hard. Huh? And so, uh, yeah, so this is kind of the sense of identity that you have. So not only are you enjoying these things, but you are identifying with these things. And then just as you are enjoying and identifying with all this wealth, it doesn't sound so bad by our standards, but you know, you had to kind of adjust for modern standards. Maybe you have your 
private plane, yeah, you have your little kind of a private jet that you take and zips you around the world there. Uh, but then when the owners see them, they take back your private plane there. <laughs> they take back what is theirs. Uh, and then would that be enough for that man to get upset? Uh, yes. Why? Because the owners took back what is theirs. Uh, and uh, so uh, the idea here is this idea that uh, everything we own in this world uh, is borrowed. Uh, yeah? Everything we have in this world, we have it for a short while. Uh, and then after we had it for a short while, then nature takes it back again. Uh, nature taking it back is basically the idea of impermanence, uh, of unreliability, of uncertainty. Uh, and when I say everything, I mean almost everything in this five sense world we have to leave behind when you die. Sometimes uh, you have to leave it behind before you die. Uh, but certainly when you die, everything has to go. Uh, and when I say everything, I mean obviously all your possessions. Uh, I mean uh, uh, your relations, yeah, all the people in your life that are important to you. Uh, I mean your reputation, yeah, well, your reputation in this life, your status, who you are as a person. All of that really belongs to this world, so much that belongs to this world. Uh, yeah, and of course your body has to go as well. Uh. All of these things are borrowed goods. Uh. You have it for a while, then it has to go. Uh. And that kind of changes your idea of things. The problem in life is that we think we own these things. Uh. Just like this fellow who had borrowed a carriage and borrowed earrings, uh, after a while he identifies with that. This is me, uh. this is my things. Uh. And if you think that you own something, and then it gets taken away from you because actually it is borrowed, then it is painful, then it's difficult. But everything in life is actually borrowed. And it's a beautiful way of thinking about the things in this world, because the way we treat borrowed things is very different from how we treat things that we own. Yeah, if you rent a car, do you treat that car in the same way as you treat your own car? If you have your own car, and someone kind of scratches your car, what do you do? You get upset? Yes. You get upset, right? You're not so happy if someone scratches your car. But if you rent the car, and someone scratches the car, what do you think? Okay. Yeah, not so good, not nice, but okay, it doesn't matter so much. Not my car anyway. Things happen, yeah, life goes on. <laughs> it's a different feeling, yeah, it's not the same thing if it is your car, if it is something borrowed, because it has to go back to the rental agency afterwards. Uh. And what the Buddha says is that everything in our world, we should consider it more as borrowed goods. Uh. Yeah, so are you able to do that with the things that you own in your life? Uh. Are you able to see things as borrowed goods? Uh. This is kind of the, the critical question here. Uh. Can I see these glasses as borrowed goods? Uh? My glasses don't. <laughs> These are my. Can I? Is it possible? Well, uh, in a sense, you can, right? Uh, you just need to change your perception a little bit. Uh, you realize how impermanent they are. You realize chances are I'll probably forget them here at the BGF, right? Uh, probably in my room. Uh, and then anyone will have to either bring them with a courier to Perth or send them or something. Yeah. These things disappear. Glasses disappear all the time. Uh, and so the idea is to think about things in your life more like borrowed things. Uh, yeah, understand that they last for a while and then they're gone. And then treat them in accordance with that. Uh, yeah, don't treat them as something that you can control. Uh, don't treat them as something that is always going to be there. Uh, know that there's always a thief around the corner ready to steal it. Uh, there's always a natural cause. Sometimes you just forget things somewhere and you can't find it afterwards. Uh, in, in Australia we have bushfires that burn down the houses of people. Uh, there's all sorts of reasons why things come and they go. Yeah? Sometimes they just dis disintegrate by themselves because maybe when they sit down on my glasses and crunch. Oh no, I sat on my glasses. Yeah? Or it's one day, my nice computer, see this nice computer? This was given to me by all the people in Perth because I, they thought I needed a computer when I'm going to teach. So they gave me this computer. You know what this computer is called? It's an Asus Zenbook. Wow. Yeah, that's why I guess this for monks, yeah, Zen book, yeah. <laughs> especially for monks. Yeah. That's why I got this one because it's called Zen book. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, one day I will probably drop it. Yeah, and when you drop it, of course, it doesn't work anymore. What happened to my computer? And it's not so much the computer, what is even worse? It's all the things I have on it, right? Uh, all the things that I have worked hard on, uh, translations, have, what have you. Uh, and you know, it's like your life's work is kind of on this computer. Uh, what happens when your life's work is lost? Do you grieve? Do you become sad? Do you become upset? 
Do you jump up and down? Oh no, do you commit suicide? Do you jump off a tall building? Because your life's work has gone to dust. People do that, right? And this is the problem, because your life's work is like everything I've done in my life is all gone down the drain. Oh no, what a terrible thing. One of the most kind of really great stories about the life's work getting lost is the story of Ajahn Brahm in uh, Bodhinana Monastery. It's a really beautiful story. It's in that little book called The Karuna Virus. Have you seen The Karuna Virus book? Yeah? yeah? The first story in that book. Yeah? And uh, we call it Karuna Virus because it was, it, we did it at the beginning of the coronavirus epidemic. Yeah? So we thought Karuna Virus is much nicer. Yeah? Spreading the virus of, of compassion. Yeah? And so we put together this book. It was actually people in Hong Kong who asked me if we could do that. Uh, uh, and I, usually we go to Hong Kong every year as well. We go around uh, everywhere now. Uh. And that story is the story of the big fire at Bodhinana Monastery. Uh. This was in 1991, in January, before I wasn't even at the monastery yet. Uh, I was still three years into the future before I came. <laughs> uh, but uh, January 1991, this was the hottest day on record in Perth. Uh. 46 degrees, uh, right? Uh, yeah. Really, really hot. You think Malaysia is hot? Nothing compared to Perth when it gets really hot. Uh, and Perth, no humidity, so it's kind of really dry, so the sun is like really kind of searing, yeah? It's like searing kind of heat. Uh, and uh, end of January, that is the end of the dry season usually in Perth. Dry season begins like maybe beginning of November, so it hasn't seen any rain for the previous three months. Yeah, no rain for three months. You can imagine how dry everything is. If you see a picture of Perth, everything is like brown and gray, tiniest kind of flame, and just poof, everything kind of goes up. Yeah? And so there was a fire started not so far from the monastery, and usually these fires are started by pyromaniacs or something like that. So the fire was started, and then the fire was moving. There wasn't that much wind, but a little bit of wind. So the fire was moving towards the monastery. 46 degree, everything is completely dry, yeah? Coming closer and closer to the monastery, yeah? And then the fire brigade, they come to the monastery and they say to Ajahn Brahm, they say to the monks, you have to evacuate, yeah? So everyone kind of comes together in the main hall, right? And then they say, I don't know, oh, wait a little bit, let's see what happens. And eventually the fire brigade says, no, there's no chance, this is all going to burn down. We have to evacuate. And this is in 1991. This is just when Ajahn Brahm has finished building Bodhinyana Monastery. He has spent the previous eight years, day and night, working 12-hour days, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, continuously building this monastery. This is his life's work. Yeah, Everything that he has done, basically, was about this monastery. And now he is told that everything is going to burn down. And so I asked Ajahn Brahm, how did you feel at that moment? And he said, at that moment, when I knew everything is going to burn down, I knew my life's work was in ruin, yeah. At that moment, I just let go like that. And I thought, what? <laughs> How is that possible? You've been working so hard on something. If someone took you know, my life's work and threw it out, I would feel at least, oh no. At least I would say, oh no, yeah, before I came to my senses. <laughs> And so I asked him, how, how can you do that? How is it possible to let go, like so fast? And then comes the very interesting answer. And this is how you should think about things. And if you think about things in this way, you will never grieve for the borrowed goods of your life. And he said, what he said was, I didn't build the monastery to make a monastery. That was kind of secondary. The reason I was building a monastery, because I knew it was a good act. It was a good action. It was an action of generosity. It was an act that would benefit many other people. I did it because it was a practice of the Dhamma to build a monastery. I did it because of the good intentions. And I knew that even if the monastery burned down, I could continue that act of generosity next day. Yeah, actually more, more chance of generosity because the monastery is gone. Now we can have even more generosity, right? So maybe it's a good thing that the monastery burns down there. <laughs> I'm exaggerating here. <laughs> yeah, and that is the right kind of attitude. You don't do things in the world because you are going to have success. You do things because they are acts of kindness and generosity. That is when you are embedding the spiritual practice completely within your ordinary life. Everything is done for a spiritual purpose. And when everything is done for a spiritual purpose, you can't lose out. 
Your borrowed goods get taken away. Someone steals your car. Someone burns down your house. And you think, to be expected, yeah, next house. Uh, yeah? That is kind of the right way of thinking about things. Uh, when you think like that, uh, then your life turns into a spiritual quest, a spiritual pursuit, uh, and then you will never really be disappointed in life. Uh. So this is the idea, yeah? You understand things are borrowed goods. Uh, you don't know how long they're going to last. Uh. Sooner or later, your monastery is going to burn down. I right? don't know if you have a monastery, but if you, if you have one. Huh? So this is how things go. Huh? So when that changes your attitude to life, yeah? you start to think of life, okay, actually, I'm here to do acts of kindness. That's what I'm here. And whatever is kind, whatever is generous, and whatever makes more compassion and kindness in the world, or whatever creates more love, understanding, positive feelings, uh, that is what is good. And I can always do that, even if kind of things just burn down and disappear. I can always carry on with that project. Uh, then you're thinking in the right way. And of course, what happens if you do that, uh, when you come to the very end of your life, yeah, you're on your deathbed, uh, you know, this is it, uh, I'm finished. Uh, yeah, I'm about to pass away, about to die. Uh, you're kind of lying back, kind of reflecting on your life. Now, if you are on your deathbed, in a hospital or whatever, about to die, if everything you have done in life is just about having possessions, having relationships, uh, building up wealth, you know, doing, having status, uh, if that is all your life is about, building up a nice body, yeah, going to the gym, training the body up, looking just right, uh, yeah, if that is what your life is about, uh, then all of that uh, is going to have to go when you die. Everything is going to be have to be left behind. How do you feel on your deathbed when everything you have lived for, the whole purpose of your life, is going to disappear? How does that feel? It feels terrible. It feels confusing. It feels like you have wasted your time, right? Everything is going to have to go. Why did I do that for anyway? Now it's all going to have to go. I'm going to go into the future. I can't take anything with me. And even if my family burns paper money or paper cars, why? Well, it's not going to help me in the next life. It's not just in the Chinese tradition to do that, right? You know, the, the Taoist tradition, they burn little houses and things like that, so you can take the smoke goes up to heaven and take it with you into the future. This is like a universal thing, yeah? Yeah, the, um, in Norway, the, my ancestors, the Vikings, they did the same thing. We had a Viking ship, put all the belongings into the Viking ship. The wife, it's kind of terrible, yeah, the wife goes into the Viking ship, the dead body, and you burn everything, and then everything goes off to Valhalla in the next life. That's kind of the idea. This is to be universal ideas in humanity. Same thing in India, you have the idea of sati, which is kind of you, your wife, you're supposed to commit suicide when you die, these kind of things. Same kind of idea, you want to be together in the afterlife. And so you feel a sense of despair because you are on your deathbed. Everything you have worked for, everything that matters to you is going to have to be left behind. This is called short-term investment, not understanding the larger scale of reality. Wrong view, there's only one life, yeah? When, or if there is another life, I don't care about the other life, yeah? Why? Because it's far away and into the future. I don't know about it anyway. It's a wrong view, huh? misunderstanding the nature of things. Huh? But if you take into account the fact that there is a larger reality, huh? you're going to have to go somewhere after you die, yeah? Then, of course, you change your strategy. Huh? Then you come to your deathbed huh? and you think everything is going to have to go. But actually, huh? I have lived my life for another purpose. I have lived my life to be kind, to be generous, to support other people, to have metta, to have compassion, to do all the right things, to build up wisdom. That's why I've lived my life. And these qualities, they reside in my heart, in my mind. And because they reside in my heart and my mind, I can take them with you into the future. That's the difference, right? You don't lose those things when you go into the future. That's the beauty of this. And when the Buddha says you have to be, you are the heir of your karma, that is what it means. Yeah, your karma is the quality of your heart, the quality of your mind, that which travels on together with your mind from one life to the next one. That is your karma. So make sure you build that up, because that is the long-term investment. That is what you bring with you into the future. And not only do you bring it from one life to the next one. If you want to be on the path to awakening, to insight, to wisdom, to understanding, uh, the path to getting out of all the dukkha and trouble, uh, 
achieving the paramang nibbana, paramang sukhang nibbana is the highest happiness. Uh, if that is what you want to achieve, you're also on the right track for that as well. Uh, everything good comes from that. Uh, so, think about life in a new way. Uh, understand what is borrowed. Uh, understand what is truly yours. Uh, yeah, you are the owner of your kamma. The kamma is what is yours. Uh, even kamma ultimately is not really yours, but at least it is much more yours than the, all the other stuff uh, because it lasts much longer. Uh, yeah, and this is kind of how to think about this. Uh, then you are on the right track. Uh. Yeah, aren't these similes of the Buddha, aren't they brilliant? Uh? Yeah. yeah. It's so powerful, right? It's so simple. It's so obvious when you think about it, and yet no one thinks about it. Uh. It's kind of crazy, isn't it? Uh, the, the, the teaching is there. So much of the spiritual path is so bleeding obvious when you think about it, uh, and yet the world doesn't really get it. Uh. Isn't that kind of weird? Uh? I'd say, you know, I mean, I know for myself how foolish I would have been without the Buddha's teachings. Uh, and yet when I see them, actually, yes, it makes very good sense. Uh. So this is the idea of the borrowed goods. Uh. So uh, think about things more in terms of uh, these things, uh, then you're going to be on the right track. Yeah. Okay, maybe let's do a little bit of meditation together. Okay, any uh, comments or questions from anyone? Uh, I just want to check, I uh, just want to uh, ask about this, when you shared the story uh, about Ajahn Brahm and the temple burning down and uh, so there's no attachment to the temple burning down but would there be an attachment to the process and the accomplishments to that um, for somebody for example, you know? Um. Well, if you identify with it, you know, if you take this to be your uh, kind of, I, I did this, if you feel conceited about it or you feel proud about it or whatever, then there would be that kind of attachment uh, probably. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think for Adam Ram, he realizes that that's just a stupid kind of conceit, yeah, to be attached to those things. Uh, and so you let go of the temple, you let go of any pride in having accomplished it, you know, all those things, or everything kind of goes. Uh, and if you feel proud about anything, I don't think you ever really feel proud, ideally. But if you are proud about something, it's about having lived well. Yeah, you feel good about yourself because you have lived well. You don't really feel proud, just feel good about yourself because you have done the right thing and lived in a good way. So there's, a, there's kind of like a balance of being proud of it and also being prideful or egoistic about it as well, right? And how, how, how would one be able to strike that kind of balance. What, what do you mean? What, I mean, yeah. be, like you said, you know, to feel good about what you've done, yeah, yeah. but also at the same time, one can also feel prideful about it yeah. um, as well, that becomes egoistic as well. Yeah. So how would one be able to, to distinguish this feel, being feeling good about yourself and not taking it to the point of being prideful right, yeah. about it. Yeah, so uh, the, uh, the difference is that uh, when you feel uh, good about it, it's like, you know, let's say you just do a random act of uh, kindness on the street, a, a, a strange someone you have never seen before. Uh, uh, you don't do it if you're proud of that, because you don't, don't tell anyone, you don't know about it, uh, and you just feel this warm feeling inside. You know that you've done something good, it's a warm kind of feeling that you feel, uh, because you've done something kind of, yeah? And uh, whereas pride has to do with ego, has to do with a sense of self, it's kind of boosted. Uh, so if you close your eyes and you sit in meditation, and you just feel the kind of warm feeling inside, knowing that you're living well, uh, that is really the idea of, uh, you know, of uh, what we're trying to develop here, this is what it's about, uh, yeah. There's a kind of quiet thing, it's not a kind of here I am, yeah, kind of thing, it's a kind of quiet, peaceful sense of uh, happiness about things. Uh, yeah. hmm. Okay, anything else? Uh, 
by the way, the monastery didn't burn down, so it was kind of lucky. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't get the real test. So, 